Welcome everybody. Today we're going to work on the fabric identification. You have four of these sheets. They should be labeled as we discussed before into plain weave, satin weave, twill weave, and non-woven. So that's what you want to do. If you have not done that, they need to be on the top. And this is neat and tidy. I'm just going to screen share the canvas page for a second. Also in your handbook, you have in your supplies bag, you not only have these, you also have your rubric for that, which is a small half page sheet or quarter page. And you have the lecture notes that we went over on Monday, as well as the weave samples, which are also online. And then what we're working with today are descriptions. So I'll be sharing that as well. So I wanted to let you know that you should be finding those in your supplies bag. And if you don't have them, let's make sure that you can get them and I'll show you online. I'm gonna screen share this section. Oh yeah, here's all the people that are in a class that actually are continuing to work. So don't be surprised when we just have a few people. It's, uh, it's always an option for them to work that way. So here we are, we are in um, our modules. And we are in week nine of our course. So fabric identification, lecture notes and recording. If we wanna take a look at that page. Uh, this discusses, this is would be showing you a plain weave. We talked about, this was the lecture in PDF form, which I just showed you. So everyone has that, I don't know, remember, don't do that, Pam. So you have that also in hard copy, but you can reference it here online so that you see when we discuss our fibers, this goes along with your textbook, your chapter three textbook. Then weaving terms, which we discussed yesterday, I mean, Monday. And it's worth a moment to take a look at these. So this is talking about a loom, parts of a loom. The lengthwise grain is the warp. So here's the warp beam going traveling this way the warp threads, as you see, are the longest threads. The cloth is rolled onto the fabric beam. The filling yarn is the crosswise grain. And you can see that this is a shuttle. It wraps around, as we've always talked about, and comes back and forth. The batten holds up alternate threads so that the shuttle can go through and finish the completed weave. The batten is the beater that pushes the yarn into place, okay? So what's gonna happen actually, the heddles will lift each of the, the warps, the batten pushes it into place. So there's your description, pushing it into place, the beams hold the warp yarn or the fabric the heddle lifts up the threads into the predetermined patterns, which means when we're doing plain weave, it's gonna hold every other one up, okay? This is a shuttle so that the, um, is the yarn holder and can go back and forth through the lifted up warp yarns. Here's a different kind of shuttle. The warp is the lengthwise yarns, the weft, is the filler or cross grain yarns, okay? So that helps you. Weaving is four stops, shedding, which is separating the warps. So they lift up the warps so that then you can pass the shuttle between, then you beat it up, push the thread into place, and then you unroll. So you see, you lift it up, throw the shuttle between, the shuttle ends up on this side, the batten pushes the finished fabric. And then when it gets a certain length, it's rolled up. So those are your four sections. Let's just get rid of that for a sec. 
And then here are some looms that we can take a look at. So this is a little PowerPoint presentation. We discussed some of these in a different way. So this is a backstrap loom, which we talked about. It can be tied on to anything. Here's, here is one warp beam. The fabric warp beam is here in the lap of the person. And then the warp beam can be tied on to any support system. It can be tied on to a tree branch, okay? So that the warp is suspended evenly between the warp beam where the, the warp is tied on and then the rolled fabric as it is rolled onto the fabric beam. It's portable. So this is what it looks like. Here's the, the warp beam. Here's the one that would be the fabric that would be rolled up. This is the, this is a header with the holes in it. And then beating down would happen with a fork and I'll show you what that looks like. So there's the shuttle that's gonna pass in between wrapping around to create a salvage edge. Traditional floor loom, you can see again, warp beam, they're working on top of it. The fabric is behind them. Here's a frame loom. So it's in a specific frame the warps, this is, this is the whole length of this fabric. It's probably a small carpet. So it goes from here to here, could be four feet. This would be the um, pedal. So it could lift up different warps. See, this is a, this batten in here twists on the side. Actually, sorry, take that back. This is a smooth um, stick, which you use the pointed end to lift up the warps that you need to get out of the way so that you can then throw the shuttle in between. Oh, this is just a small nailed loom. So it's just showing you how you can create a small nailed loom. The width of a traditional loom is exactly what you see. It can be no wider. The shuttle, these are the heddles lifting up the warp and then the shuttle would wrap around creating the salvage. This is a cool, uh, I saw one of these in person. They traveled this ancient Chinese brocade loom. It's a two person loom and brocade is woven on both sides at the same time. So the harness puller is on top and they pull the warp threads so that the weaver down below can pass the shuttle back and forth and then pull the batten towards the fabric that's finished. Uh, this is a, the original jacquard loom, which is a more complex weaving technique. And then this is a jacquard controlling harness. You can see it can get extremely complex. And then this is the um, pattern in this punch card system, which is talking to the machine so that it shows which ones you want to pull up. This is at a weaving machine in Evansville, Indiana. So when we had textile weaving here in the United States, it was very common. This is the finished fabric getting rolled onto the fabric beam. You can see this would be for yards and yards and all of the warp threads up here in spools that are very large and then pushing the shuttle through and pulling the um, harness down. So this is a, a automated rapier air jet weaving machine. Look, it's an incredible piece. Face of fabric woven side up, rolled inside. So all of these are very, very um, sophisticated. Where the water, air, or missile shot across the loom, weft and fill, filler threads are cut before returning. So high-speed loom, cheapest. The salvage is frayed out. New high quality denim sells itself as salvage denim or woven on a shuttle loom, slower and more expensive. So you can see the finished edges. That's kind of funny. All these incredible different weaving things. And then we are gonna be talking about different kinds of fabrics today. So satin fabric, twill weave, 
different kinds of things. And we looked at these also in our um, class on Monday. So now we're to that. You can just see what that is. You want to read these chapters and that would be the introduction of the first lecture with the weaves. <clears throat> I'm going to go up to the modules and go to the other fabric identification, which I think is the next page, but I don't want to just um, click next and end up on some kind of weird page. Okay, so here is the assignment page. And this shows you what is expected for the compilation of the Fabric ID notebook. Here are the instructions to create your paper weaves. This is the burn test, which I will demonstrate. Safety protocol for the burn test. This is a um, lecture from last spring about the burn test. And I'll do my own and maybe I'll take that off if I think it's better. The sample weaves description, your fabric identification rubric. Okay, so all of these elements are what are going into your fabric ID and it's pretty straightforward. It's a fabric identification project. You'll be illustrating the text with real fabric swatches. So you can look at this and the rubric is very specific. So you can look at things that give you the grade. I'll show you, this is what you should have in your kit. So that, again, the organization of your fabric ID can go right on the back of your sewing notebook. You can just have a fabric ID section and you can put it in your binder. You're gonna give yourself student points for if you have yours easily negotiated in information. Is what does your presentation look like? The content and quality, and this will be your content checklist and the completeness of it. And you're gonna look at your checklist for this. So each of these has a total of, uh, a, the project is a total of 50 points. And this is how you accrue those points. Part one is you're gonna write an introduction that is really just about five sentences long. A paragraph identifies the purpose and value of the fabric identification section. You're gonna do this after we have our after we do our session today. You're going to do your paper weaves, plain weave, twill weave, satin weave, mounted and presented on paper. That's nine points. You have three weaves completed and you'll be, um, I'll show you, we talked about those last time. You'll have your, you can do extra credit ones as well. So those will be shown later. You'll have your fiber, fabric, and thread samples all organized onto your grid pages. They'll be identified so that we know what they are. Plain weave by the fiber, whether it's cotton, wool, rayon, ramey, whatever it is, we'll talk about those today. They'll be mounted on your grid pages and you have four total pages and the samples that you have already pre-cut. You will do three fabric fiber sample burn tests. And that's what I'm gonna go through today. And you will then identify the fiber. This will be an educated guess. And as we finish the burn test, you will understand how to do that. The fabric fiber burn test must be with something that is not already included in your fabric samples because I'm giving you all the information for that. So you'll want to figure out three pieces of fabric that you have laying around the house. It can be a rag, it can be anything. We often are looking for fiber content of garments that don't have a label in them. And we look for a, a hem or some small place where we can then trim off a few fibers. You can use a dish towel, you can use just about anything. And then there are extras included and this accrues your 30 points. There's the fabric store list, which is included in your supplies. And you can also add more fabric stores if you wish. The fabric modification information, which talks about dyeing. The thread count information, which is um, we talked about last time, which is determining how many threads per square inch. That's thread count. We're going to talk about that with your very first sample. OK, so that's our rubric.
And here is the fabric identification document, which gives you the expectation of how to complete everything, what everything is, and then your introduction and how to do that, okay? Here are your instructions to do your paper weaves. And we went over this at length on Monday, so we'll not repeat. But you will be doing these three, plain weave, twill weave, satin weave. Additional weaves will be extra credit. Here's your required supplies. This is what you want to do. It can be colored paper or otherwise not plain white. So it could be printed. You can use recycled paper on the plain side and recycled paper on a printed side. That's completely OK. And this is really important that the warp page, which is the white, is the vertical. The weft page is at 90 degrees and is horizontal. Sorry. I am telling you the wrong thing. Label the colored piece warp and the white piece weft. So do what this says, not what I just said. The warp piece is the colored piece or the printed piece and the white piece is the weft. And then this gives you the instructions for how to make a plain weave. And this is exactly what it's gonna look like. If you do this one, which is over two, under two, under two, over two, row two, three, this is extra credit. So each weave sample has a required twill weave, a herringbone would be extra credit. And you can figure out how to do the um, directions for each of those weaves. Satin weave is indicated here. And this sateen weave would be extra credit. So that has a longer, it has a seven row pattern that we would follow for weaving. All right, so that is what we really did on Monday. And I just wanted to make sure everyone is very clear where to find these things. We will talk about the burn test later today and I'll set up the safety protocol and show you how the burn test works. And this is our weaves sample description. So each of you has this in your in um, paper copy. So we can do this. And we're going to start now with our very first weave. Does everyone have this paper um, copy with you? Can you just either raise your hands or um, raise your, your blue screen or something like that? Yes, no? Yeah, I have it, Pam. OK, because then I won't necessarily show it. Um, on the screen, I can then hold up the fabric swatch and talk about those instead. I feel like that may be more valuable. If we're in person, what I do is uh, I have that on the um, screen in the room and then I hold up the fabric sample so you see both. But I don't know how to do that to do a screen share and show you the fabric sample. Unless you guys can think that um, doing the screen share of the words and then holding up the fabric sample in the small corner image is enough. What's your, what's your pleasure? Comments? I think the fabric squares would be more helpful. I think helpful. I have a question though, which <coughs> you may go over. Yeah, go ahead. Let's ask it's, questions now. Is good. Um, on the the blank four pages that are squares where we're yep. going to glue everything. Yep. I didn't write anything. Okay. What are we supposed to write as we'll, we go? Okay, very good. The first group that we're going to go through is going to be plain weave. So you want to write plain weave up here. Just worry about one page at a time and When you put your book together, that can correspond with your plain weave warp weft pattern that you've done, your paper pattern. Do your plain weave pattern and then put your plain weave samples behind it so that you always know my plain weave is over one, under one. Does that make sense? 
And then what we'll do is organize this page. So you're going to start by taking apart, everyone should have this labeled plain weave. You're going to take apart your two pins so that this one says non-woven. We're gonna set that one aside. We're gonna start with woven and take this piece of paper off. The very first sample that you have is this sample that is a very loose weave. Hold on one second, Pam. Yep, let's pause for a sec. So really do tape them down and tape your weft down because they are so wiggly that that will help the frustration level be reduced. And then this is what I meant by, if you have a piece that has some kind of mark on it, you can use that as your warp and this is your weft because you can see a difference there. So again, it can be a printed piece, a colored piece and a white piece, okay? So yeah, they're really fun and it will show you, you can do the basket weaves. Did you do extra credits, Cara? I didn't because that last one, I actually tried the last one without taping it down because I thought I was like, you know, advanced. Expert. And yeah, and that's a hard weave anyways. And so I, I just needed to finish. So I finished the three yeah. main ones, but I may still go back and try another one. You don't, one. you don't, don't, no requirement at all. But you know, when you then do this, now look at this, which is our plain weave. We have our plain weave um, labeled here, okay? The first sample is gonna go into this corner. So I'm going to talk about this sample, which is our um, cheesecloth. And I'm gonna use my colored piece just to demonstrate against it so that you can see some of these fabrics are very transparent. Okay. So there's the cheesecloth that each of you should be holding in your hand. And you can clearly, some of you may have to put on your glasses, but you can clearly see it's an open weave and how it goes over one, under one, over one, under one. Okay. So this sample, is a natural fiber, plant-based, which is cellulosic, loose weave, cotton, and the common name for it is cheesecloth. And that is in your sample page. So what you wanna know is that this is cheesecloth and it's cotton. So I can put that, I'll just do a couple, I'll just do one for you. And I'm gonna glue, do my glue stick. So my glue stick's purple. <laughs> but one thing about your glue stick, okay, this will disappear. My purple will disappear. You want to mount your sample so that the vertical is the warp, the weft is the cross grain, and that you can lift it up and not only read what you wrote, that it's cotton and cheesecloth, but that way you can actually touch the sample still. And that's really important because you learn to learn uh, about fiber by touch. You have sense memory, and this is one of your really important memories when you're looking at fiber. So we will continue across this way so that the next sample that we have is muslin. And we talked about sizing. This piece is stiff. Sorry, Pam. Yes. Can I use a two slided tape? Because I don't have a glue stick at home. Okay. And you I asked you to get a glue stick. You know, okay. so you yes, Catherine also asked about two sided tape earlier. Did you hear that? Mm -hmm. If you use two-sided tape, you want to cut a very narrow piece 
sure. so that you're only glue taping the first tiny part of this to your page. Okay, got it. So it's a much more um, it's a much more difficult thing to do because you still want to be able to lift this up and touch it and write your information down below. So there's a, a lot of things you wanna be able to do with that, okay? So you want to just use a very small amount of glue and or glue stick and like, like Catherine's gonna do, she's just gonna use straight pins. Okay, so I'm gonna look at this and say, okay, I can see this goes over under and you can see that there's a rigidity to this fabric. Okay, and that is plain weave, plant-based. Again, it's cotton. I'm, now I'm trying to get this on my page. So you want it on your page neat. It fits in the square beautifully. And that will be indicated as it's a natural fiber, plant-based, cotton, unwashed muslin. And unwashed muslin has this thing called sizing. Sizing is a lightweight glue that's put into the fabric. We talked about that on Monday when we talked about how we put in um, weight into silk because when they boiled the silk out for the strands, they got lighter weight and then people felt like they were gypped. So they put in weighted silk to create heaviness. So sizing, helps it roll on the bolt. And you can see that it creates the um, rigidity of the fiber. Compare that to your very next sample, which is washed muslin. So taking a look at this, you can see that it is much softer. It's not rigid at all, but it is exactly the same product. It is a natural fiber plant-based, it is cotton. Cotton is the plant and it's just washed muslin. So what has happened is the, the sizing has been washed out of it. Okay, and I can pull my thread so I know my lengthwise and cross. I know my grain is even. There's a torn edge and I'm gonna mount it this way. And again, if you look very, very closely right here, you can see over one, under one, over one, under one. And it may be easier to see that way than it is to see in person because you can see it magnified. And then that goes in your third spot. And again, it's cotton unwashed or washed muslin. All right, fourth spot. Yours may be slightly different and it doesn't matter. This is representing a category of cloth. It is not the only print that happens. This is a natural plant-based material. It is cotton, it's printed. So printed means that this side is printed for the garment side. The underside as we learned with our fabric samples is the wrong side. So it's printed here and on the inside it's not as bright. So printed muslin is calico, that's the common name. And it might be light brown, this one's green and it has a floral design. A, a typical calico does have a floral design. And that goes in your fourth category. And the next sample we have. So if you were gonna number these on your page, the numbers that you have are on your sheet. So if that makes it clearer for you, I'm going to repeat those because there's some that don't, they're not exactly corresponding. So cheesecloth is one, unwashed muslin's 1A, washed muslin is number two, the calico is number three, and this piece is number four, although it's going in the fifth slot. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, this piece is a natural plant-based. It also has some synthetic and I can tell because it has a slight stretch here. And this is cotton with a lycra blend. There, even if I'm on my bias, it stretches more, but on my cross grain, it stretches. This has a vertical 
rib, and that is typical. It's called corduroy. It has an extra set of threads wrapped around to create the pile. So if you look at it this way, you can see that there is a thickness here as opposed to something like this where there is not that extra set of threads and it is very thin. See the difference in the thickness of the material? So there's an extra set of threads wrapped around that create this loft and that is called pile. And that means that this is a directional fabric so that when you look at it from one direction, it looks, has one look and from the other direction, it has a different look. The ribs are vertical. So make sure that you indicate that the ribs go up and down, yet it is still a plain weave with an extra set of threads. Okay, I'm gonna pause for a second. Okay, I'll do that again, sorry. Number one, number 1A, number two, number three, number four. So you may ask, why isn't it just number two? It's because we have this elaborate system of swatching where each baggie is labeled because normally when we were in class, I would pass those out and you would take your own swatch and then you would paste it down. But because we're not in class, we have had to uh, invent different ways to do this. Um, last spring, we put a we put a number on everything and that just took, it, it took so long, like eight hours or more just to do this portion and we couldn't do that. So now we're doing it this way. <laughs> so if you keep your pin here, you'll always be in the correct order. And we're working with wovens only. All right, so number five, this is a natural fiber, plant-based cotton. Does this resemble anything to you guys? So look at oh, it. It resembles the corduroy. Yes, it resembles the corduroy. So if we look at this, this does not have lycra in it, but you can see the thickness and the thick and thinness creates the rib. Okay, so that's why it goes up and down. And this is a extra set of yarns here they're woven this way, nothing showing on the back. And what happens is two pieces are woven together and then they're cut. So this is wide whale. The previous one had much skinnier whales. It was called pin whale. So this is your wide whale, corduroy, cotton. Corduroy tends to be cotton. Okay, our next group is natural fiber. You may have something uh, slightly different than this, but this is a natural fiber plant-based cotton. It's called flannel. There's a brushed surface. Remember we talked about surface treatment on Monday and that would could be agitated. So if you look at this carefully, you see that the surface is distressed compared to the backside where the surface is not distressed. So this has been brushed to create loft. And you can see that the threads are sticking up and loft creates warmth. So it creates warmth, it traps air, which traps it to your body and that's why flannel is warmer. So you might have, uh, you might have pink with swirly designs. Um, if you're, this is the black faced, the thicker yarn is the weft and that tends to be typical. So if I pull this apart, looking at my thicker yarn there, that's the weft, that's my cross grain. And let's look at the other one. Okay, and you can clearly see that this is the weft the cross grain, so I'm gonna put it this way. I'll mount it this way. And this is my, let me put my paper up here so you can see that. This is a thinner yarn, that's my warp. The agitation is on the weft and the weft, remember, is the weaker yarn. The cross grain yarn is the weaker yarn and often is the style detail. The warp is stronger. It's, although it's thinner, but it is stronger. You can't pull it apart. I bet we can pull the weft apart. Yep, see? 
Okay, so you want to mount it this way. Our next piece, which is number seven, and it will be going, you're now on the second row. Aha, uh -huh. that is a mistake. I hope you guys didn't get that mistake. So you might need to look at that. Um, so I'm gonna look here. Okay, number seven is natural fiber. It is plant-based. And you can see that there is a pile to it, but this does not have a rib. So this is a natural pile called velveteen. Velveteen is different because there's my extra set of threads. You can see them woven in there as I pull this apart. Shoot, I just have it. You can see there. See the extra fuzzy stuff right here? That is an extra set of threads that are wrapped around to create that. And then here's my warp, my skinnier, my skinnier yarn, okay? So velveteen, again, natural fiber plant-based, it's cotton pile. And you could just put number seven in that square. You might have blue or black or that slightly greeny tone. The next number eight, is a natural fiber plant-based. Remember all of these are plain weave even there's though there's such a variety. This is cotton, it is eyelet, and eyelet is determined by a plain weave background with an extra set of threads which is called embroidery. It's an extra set of design yarn on the surface to create a design. Eyelet is also noted by this fact that there is a hole and then the hole has been um, stabilized by hand by stitching around it. Now it's done by machine and eyelet meaning it's an eye hole. Okay, and this happens to be white. Your next piece is a natural fiber plant based. It's linen. You might have a slight color to it. This one is a printed piece. Again, if we look up close, we can really see the over under pattern to it. Even here, you can see one over one, under one, over one, under one. And then this would be my weft, it's thicker. And let's take a look at the warp. Just carefully trying to pull that apart. Yeah, it's more tightly woven than it seems. There we go. So it is thinner versus my thicker weft. So it's one way you can always tell the difference. And linen is a plant that has the flax plant that has a longer staple fiber. Remember staple is our measurable fiber. So this one could be 18 to 24 inches long where our cottons tend to be one and three quarters inches to six inches. And you could have, um, this, is, this one happens to be silk screened so the pattern is painted on top and I can feel it silk screened, but again, I have a wrong side and a right side. The next fiber, natural fiber, cellulosic plant fiber called jute, and this is burlap. And this is very easy to see our over under pattern because it's a loose weave. Loose weave meaning there's a lot of holes in between, okay? We're starting the third row with the burlap. Number 11, <clears throat> this is a modified natural fiber. Remember when we had man-made rayon and acetate. So this is happens to combine both of those. Natural fiber is tree pulp, tree pulp is determines rayon and you can see that we have our thicker and thinner threads. So we are gonna mount it this way. It's an orange print. I just love this. We cut up a pair of pants. So that's number 11. Number 12, we're now to our first protein fiber. 
Okay, looking at this, this is a very dense color, black, protein. Uh, this is a staple fiber, it's sheep wool. Remember wool has a kink and is resilient, meaning it has a memory and it will go back into its shape. You might have a plaid. So I wanna see if we can see the kink. Look at the hairs that are sticking out from the edge of this piece. You can see how, how hairy it is. And the kink is much more pronounced than in the other fibers that we pulled out, even from just being woven. So it's got, a, it's thicker, it doesn't have a pile. It's simply that the yarn, the wool is hairier. So when you twist it into the yarn, more fibers are going to stick out, but because it has a kink, it will stick together more easily. This is a staple fiber, meaning it's measurable, generally, again, between um, you know four to, four to eight inches, depending on what kind of uh, sheep it's from. The next piece could be black, it can be purple, it could be anything. This is a protein fiber. It's a filament, and this is dupioni. It's silk, so the, the common name for it is silk. The, I guess maybe the generic name is silk, and the common name is dupioni, and that is characterized by the weft, which carries a slub yarn, and slub meaning there's a thickness or thinness to the yarn. So if you look very carefully at this, and I don't know if you can see it in the screen, but you can see that there is a thicker thinness. You see some unevenness right here, and that would be the weft. So it should go this way, okay? But you feel this, when you feel silk and wool, you're going to feel a warmth to the fabric. It just has a warmth to it. And then that does trap in body heat. Remember that was our first winter clothing wear used during war. The next one is very transparent. You can look at, you can even see through it completely. This is a protein fiber also. Isn't it amazing? Protein fiber, protein fiber could not be more different. So it doesn't have to do with the depth of it or anything. This is a silk. So it's a filament fiber, meaning it's long, 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 not measurable. It could be, it could be miles long. This is translucent, meaning we can see through it. Not completely transparent, but translucent. Yes, that is the same. Yep. Okay, Thanks, got it. Hansen. Yeah. Is this a different pattern? It, it can be a different pattern. So you might have the brown swirl. Okay. That's okay. completely fine. Okay. So again, this is creped chiffon. So it might have a kink. If it's creped, the fabric itself is crimped. Okay. So yours. That particularly that one, that brown one, has a really distinct bubbly texture to it. Can you see that, Svensson? So this is called chiffon, it's translucent. So this is number 14. It's the end of your third row. Your fourth row, or it could be that brown print is more creped. Number 15, starting our, our fourth row, is natural fiber. There's an extra set of metallic threads. Remember we talked about metallic threads originally being gold or silver, and then they became plastic or lurex. And um, this is a plastic metallic fiber so that it's not as heavy. It is a protein fiber. This is again, translucent. You can see through it, but it is also printed so it's a filament fiber, which is long, long, long silk. It's from the silkworm. The additional warp yarn vertically, which goes up and down lengthwise grain is coated with the plastic metallic lurex. And again, this is called chiffon. The crepe chiffon has a bubble or a crimp to it. And the plain chiffon is more rigid and this is transparent. So this is a multicolor, you might have blue green, you could have anything, okay? 
The next piece is a novelty piece, novelty meaning it might have a combination of things, but primarily it is a plain weave. It could be white, it could be red. This is a plastic sheeting with a cotton backing and the cotton backing is plain weave. You can see it's over one under one. So this is vinyl bonded to a plain weave, two layers glued together. And this is called oil cloth, sometimes used as tablecloths for camping and other such things, used sometimes for raincoats. And that is not, that is a modern definition of oil cloth. That is not a historically correct definition. And you could have a red print. The historically correct definition of oil cloth is cotton that had been cotton, uh, no, actually it's probably duck or linen canvas, which was made into slickers and then permeated with fish oil. And that made the oil made it into a raincoat material that fishermen wore. So this is a modern interpretation of oil cloth called vinyl or plastic sheeting. The next piece that we have, and this is an interesting piece because it's gonna be weird. This is a natural fiber. It is plant-based. Notice it has a fold on it. And this is cut at 45 degrees because it is a bias cut, okay? But our, our um, lengthwise grain goes this way and our warp our warp goes lengthwise and our weft goes crosswise. So that is actually how you're mounting it at a 45 degree angle. It's cut at 45 degrees. It is a cotton staple fiber. It is created to have stretchiness and notice that you can't ravel the edge because the bias um, inhibits raveling. And this is called bias tape. So when it's folded like this, it can go over the edge of a piece of fabric and make a permanent edge. So I'm gonna show it on my shirt for a sec, or it could just do this. If this is your garment, you could put this on the edge of it. It can be a detail, a stitched in detail, and it also is stretchy so it can go around the neck. But again, your lengthwise grain is this way and your crosswise grain is that way. So can everybody see that? See the, see the length and crosswise grain as I hold it up? Goes up and down. Okay, that's called bias tape, meaning it's cut on the bias, 45 degree angle. That is number 16A. So you're on the third row, uh, fourth row, third one over. 16B, natural fiber, plant-based a cotton linen staple, the surface is shiny. And this is a coating that is water resistance, but it's not vinyl sheeting. This is much more flexible than our vinyl. And one side is shiny, the back side is not shiny. And this is over under, you can clearly see our over under pattern. Just a second, I just got my pin screwed up. Okay. So here's our over under pattern right here. So you can see clearly and you see this shiny surface which creates uh, water resistance. And this is called waxed linen. So this surface is waxed, but now it's synthetically waxed with some kind of petroleum product, not with wax. Aquamarine in color. This we used on a movie. Okay. We are now down to the fourth row and we're done with plain weave, okay? So you should have multiple pieces on your page. Let me just show you mine. And you can number them so that they correspond to your, so here's my pages. I haven't glued them all down because I wanna be able to restore this back together. So that's about what it's gonna look like for plain weave. Okay. Next, we get out another blank piece. And this will be called twill weave. 
So you want to have twill weave placed at the top of this page. And we're going into a different category. Everybody with me? So we'll start here. Now, characteristics of our twill weave. If we look at our twill weave, it has a strong diagonal appearance. Remember the diagonal is a bias, right? We just finished with bias tape and the diagonal is a bias and there is a stretch to twill. There is a stretch to twill. The very first one is one of our most easily identifiable. Again, it is natural plant-based, so weave does not determine fiber. In our plain weave, we had cotton, linen, silk, wool, synthetic, all kinds of things. The same is true in twill weave. The one thing about the twill weave is there is a strong diagonal appearance because of the way that it's woven, okay? This first piece should be recognizable to you. And when I turn it over, I'm showing you the twill weave so you see the strong diagonal and it creates a stretch because of the weave, the way that the weave is interacting with each other. This is natural plant-based, it's cotton, it's called denim. Okay, there's our denim. And the warp is blue, here we go. You know what I think? There we go. So if we look at the warp and the weft, the weft is thicker and the warp is thinner. And now you can see that strong diagonal right here. Now maybe I can do it this way. Let me lay the pin on it. See that? That creates stretch. So that's the first thing on your twill, twill weave. That's number 17 on your fabric definition page. The next piece is natural plant-based. It's a rayon. And you have to look carefully to see the twill on this. Again, rayon is modified wood pulp. There's the twill. Sometimes it's more obvious one side than another. And this has a little bit of ma masking because it feels like the surface is slightly agitated. So modified wood pulp, rayon is very mobile. It has a very soft hand, very popular in the 30s. And this is washable. And remember wood pulp is cellulosic. It's washable, you can air dry it and it gets rigid. And when you iron it, it retains, it goes back to its very mobile state. Okay, number 19 is plant-based cotton. And this is a narrow fabric. Remember I showed you a tiny narrow fabric loom where they were doing a ribbon over a series of things. This fabric is literally a half an inch wide. This is uh, cotton, it's called twill tape. It's finished on both edges and it's used for finishing and strengthening seams. So we might stitch this into a crotch seam. It comes in a variety of widths, one eighth, one half, one inch. It's very strong, okay? And if you look carefully, you can see that zigzag pattern and it's mounted this way. Let's see if the other side's easier to see. No, about the same, but you can see the strong diagonal there. Okay, that is in your, that is number 19. It goes in your third slot on your twill weave. Number 20 is our first protein based. And it's gonna be a wool, which it comes from sheep. This is a herringbone. So it's a strong diagonal in two directions. So you can see it makes a V or a chevron. Can you see that? Let me see if the backside shows it more clearly. So you can see the fabric going together in a V format. 
This happens to be two colors. Uh, this one is brown and blue. You could have bone and slate. There's a wide variety of color, but again, you can see that that picking up of the weave. And you can see that each, if I'm pulling my, my grain to see my grain, and I see both grains here, they're very hairy, okay? And that's common with wool. The next one, which is a twill weave, plant-based cotton, and again, this looks kind of like our denim, but it's only one color. Denim is always two color unless it's been over dyed. And then when you get black denim, and I remember when black denim became first popular, it's because they over dyed both pieces. So this is cotton, it's a brushed twill. This is pant weight. You could have khaki, you could have bone, you could have mustard. And then looking at that strong diagonal and looking at the back, the diagonal is less obvious You can because you're not seeing the whole uh, shape, and then you can pull that out. The brushed means that the surface has been agitated, so it looks like there's a thickness here, just like with flannel, okay? So you can see that the that there's a thickness to one side that may not be in the other. Let's see if I can pull one out. So there's your warp, and there's your weft. Slightly different, okay. That finishes your first row for your twill weave. That's number 21. Number 22 is protein-based. So it is a wool, and this happens to be wool rayon with a synthetic. This is hound's tooth. So you see that jaggedy quality. It is a diagonal, but there's a jaggedy tooth hanging down. So this is Tooth of the dog actually is interpreted in some of the language. So there's the tooth. And you have our, it's, it is a, let's see, is it printed? It's woven. So that the back and the front side are equally as bright, which means that the pattern is not printed on top. This is our first woven pattern. So the, the color of the fiber creates the pattern. Let me see if I can tell. So I think that the brown singular is the um, warp, and this is the weft. Gray, brown, white thread. Okay, next we're gonna go to our third piece. That was number 22. Then we go to our satin weave. So get another piece of paper, another of your squares. Grid page, mark it satin. Satin weave. We don't have many samples here either, so we're just gonna look at that. Plain weave is an overwhelming number of samples and that tends to be typical. Satin weave is characterized, and when you do your weaves, you'll see it has longer float threads in the warp, and that creates shine. Let me just quickly do a screen share for that so that you can understand what I'm talking about. I think I can go right to here. Okay, so this is in your notes, right? But let's go to... instructions for weaves. And we go to the bottom one and we look at satin weave. Here, this is twill, the strong diagonal. Here's satin, the long float threads. So if we were doing over under, there would be interruption, interruption. But as this is a longer float thread, that's being uninterrupted by a crossing weft yarn you will have shine. This creates a luster to the fabric. Does that make sense to everybody? So the fabric itself is characterized by a shine or a low luster. Let me get to my notes. I'm trying to put them behind me so that I can 
look at you and look at the notes without having to always look to the side. Okay. So again, characterized by longer float threads, satin weave, and we'll try and take a look at this. So you, if you look at this, you can see that it's a little bit shiny compared to a matte. Let me see if I can get a matte piece that is just compared to a white piece that is matte, this has a bit of a luster to it. And this also has a thickness to it. So there you go, flat, shiny. Okay, so this is protein based. This is a silk and yeah, you can tell there's the there's the warp, it's very, very thin, and there's the weft, it's much thicker. So the warp threads are the ones that have the longer, unbroken, interrupted um, float threads. So it's crimped, so that means it's crimped, it's crinkly, and it's also hammered, so that this is called hammered satin. It has a luster, it's white. So you can see when we look at this in different categories, you can really see it there is a really beautiful shine and a mobility to this. So we're gonna mount it that way. That's the first left on your satin page. The next piece that we have is a brocade. So this is protein based. Oh, whoops, hold on a second. My, I have separated my pin, so just a second. This is number 24. If Do you have a separate, uh, a different colored protein piece? Oh, mine's on the floor. That's what it is. Mine's gold and black. Yep. Yeah, I have a, a purple satin piece. And then I think the brocade is after that. Yep, here we go. Okay. So that's why I said, don't take it out of your pin. Mine went on the floor. So this is a protein-based silk. It's just a different color. You can see the shine is much more evident. Again, this is crimped back. It has a luster, but it's just colored. I just want you to be able to see two colors. And you can see here, this is very clear. This is that skinnier warp thread. See how skinny that is? There's your warp pulled off. And here's your weft, much thicker. And this is where you get to see where you have the unbroken threads. So it's much shinier. Okay, okay. I think I might stick something wrong because I... Should, in satin, we're in satin, you should have the first one is white, the next oh. one is colored. Yours might be purple. The purple one? I don't have a purple one. What do you have? I think one is similar. Can you show me? Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. I think this one's a little bit similar, but put, put it all, one. can you put it I all? I have a white one, it's like the same. That's the, that white one? That's the first one, right? The white one is number 23, okay? That's 20. So this one's the first one off the new yep. page? Yep. But, oh, so it might be this white one. That's it. Okay, got it. Okay. Now, the next okay, one. Second white one she has is 25. Okay, so not 25. Uh, how are they off of your pin? Because I figured it out like all of the, all of those are not at the like a so you right. Keep them in order. They are pinned on in order. You can't, if you unpin them, then we'll get really confused because we do have other white ones. So Smenson, this one, which I think is what you just showed me, but you showed me the back of it is the brocade. Okay. See, this is the back. The front has a design. Yeah. Okay. So what I want you to do is go back to the white one, the first white one that you showed me. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's hammered and you can tell it's hammered because it has this, this um, bumpy 
surface to it, okay? Has a bumpy surface compared to the next piece, which has a shinier surface. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you have this piece? So the bumpy white one, put that down in the first square is 23. If you don't have this square, leave the next square blank. This is 23A. 24 is this piece, which is brocade. This is a poly blend. Brocade is characterized by a multicolor woven design and it's not completely reversible, right? But you can see how many threads it takes to create this design. And when we looked at the, at the um, loom for this, there were so many more uh, shuttles and I mean, not shuttles, heddles that were required to create the design. So this is 24. If you don't have 23A, leave a blank for now. Okay, does that make sense, Svensson? Yeah, so my fabrics are not in the right order, so I took them out. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, let's talk about, are you coming up today? Um, I think so, after okay. the surgery. Okay, uh, if you can come up at four, that would be good, and let's review to make sure that you have your fabrics in the right order. Okay. Yeah, of course. So that's one reason why it was, if your fabrics were in completely reverse order, then you would take them out and stick them in a little pile and lift them up off the top. So this one is the brocade. It goes in the third slot on your satin weave. 25 is sateen weave. Okay, remember the difference between satin and sateen is this is not, this is not a silk or protein filament fiber. This is a cotton fiber. So I don't want any of those extra threads on there. You wanna make sure you remove that. So you can see this has a still, a long float thread on the weft, but it is cotton, so that it's called sateen. It doesn't have quite as much luster, but it does have more luster than a regular plain weave cotton, natural fiber, and it's white. Those are the four basic ones that you have for satin. Then we go to novelty fabrics and just put those on the, uh, skip a line, skip a row, because you might have more satin. And in your third row, you're gonna put novelty fabrics. Just write a note that says novelty. The first novelty fabric is a multi-dimensional fabric. It has non-woven and woven. So the first portion it's many layers with a stitch detail. This is machine quilted. So you can see my stitch detail there. The top layer is maroon. It is embossed and stamped and creating these holes that we can look through, okay? and you can see the white through it. The middle layer, uh, the back layer is Pellon, not iron-on like we're familiar with, but it is a non-woven. Here, let me get you this to show you. So it's a non-woven, you can see how transparent it is. It is to create a finished surface on the back of this three-dimensional fabric. And inside is layers of batting, also non-woven, but they can more easily fall apart multiple layers. It is held together by the stitching detail. So this is a three-dimensional fabric, which is non-woven. So this is a change. And the layer of featherweight pellet on the back. Then we have a synthetic metallic. Okay. So see how it's supposed to look like metal with all of that uh, shine and glitter. There's a plastic metallic look with Lurex. It's poly blend, polyester blend. It's to imitate the gold uh, bronzed effect. And again, you can see that our, 
it's the warp is almost invisible. Let me see if I can do this. See the tiny warp threads are so fine that the weft, which is our detail, almost overtakes it. So the warp is the lengthwise grain. It has that tiny, tiny little fringe. And then the weft is the lurex. And this is called tissue lame. Tissue lame, number 27. Okay, how about we take a little break because the next thing we're gonna go into is non-woven. You'll want to label your piece non-woven. And then we're gonna do six different varieties of things that happen here. How about a break and catch up with your, um, make sure that everything's glued down. So your last page that we just finished, satin weave should look like this. Satin weave, our two novelty pieces, and then our burn test will be down here. We'll finish out today with that and I will show you how to work with the burn test. Now we're working on non-woven. So this will be a non-woven page. There will be a wide variety of things that get attached to that page. The first, and I would recommend that you do them this way. So our first piece, you can label it at the top will be knit construction and it will go vertically down the page. This will be starting with item number 28. And it looks like you're now on your non-woven pin. Pull that out. I'm pulling off my first piece. This is knit and it's characterized by one yarn looped over itself. It has a natural stretch to it on the bias and not on the bias. So there is really no bias. It's a looped. You can see that there's a looped construction here. If you're looking carefully, it's not over one under one. It's more of a semicircle loop. This is a plain knit. It is a plant based cotton blend. And we're going to sample some of these and you'll be able to tell yours may be heathered blue or this muddy brown and you'll be able to tell that it's plant based by the way that the fiber responds. Okay, so this is our first number 28 knit goes in the top left. The next piece is a knit number 29. It is a single knit jersey, lightweight. You can see that this is a much lighter weight. You can see the loop in there when I stretch that out, but you can see that there is a lot of movement here and it is yellow. Notice it's not, it does not ravel in the same way. If we pull this, we can ladder it and make it run as one of the yarns releases and will run down the side. That's when we have run in a nylon stocking. It is called a run. That goes in your second slot down below the brown one on your same column. Our third piece is a knit. It is dark gray or green. Does anybody know what this is called? Fleece. Correct. This is fleece. So let's, what are the characteristics that we see for this? We know it is a single knit. There's one set of yarns, but there's an extra set of yarns that create the pile. We know that pile always is created by an extra set of yarns interacting with whatever our basic set is. So here is 
one set of yarns and then the pile is on top of that. And that creates a loft, remember, when it is, a, when it creates depth, it is loft. And this is a cotton blend, common term fleece. It took me the longest time to figure out what fleece was. It's like, what is fleece? So it was a, a knit with an extra set of yarns. I don't know, I wasn't thinking about it. All right, question now- Question about fleece. What's that? I have a question about fleece. Sure. Some fleece seems really high quality and holds up really well and other fleece pills and, you know, starts to look ugly really soon. Like how, how would you determine that if you're shopping for fabric? Like how do you well, know if it's good quality or not? Synthetics are gonna pill. More okay, easy. cotton, then it's probably gonna maintain its nice soft look. And cotton is, you know, it's a natural fiber. So when you wash it, it's going to, to go back to the way it was, sort of this fluffy feel. And this is cotton, it has a blend, but it is very nice. But when they get that horrible pilling on top, like acrylic will pill, acrylic sweaters will pill, but you can even get wool sweaters that will pill as well. So yeah, pilling is a, is a pain and that's why they have shavers for pilling. Yeah, it drives me crazy. I know. I Just one of those things. The next knit we have is a ribbed knit. You can see this is reminiscent of our corduroy. This is really hard in the black, but you guys should have your own. You can see the rib in your sound here. Maybe I can do it this way. So you can see the rib knit there where you see a more opaque. And now you can see the rib on the edge as I create that. So you see the up down reminiscent of corduroy. It is a vertical design. So it goes this way because it is a cuff. It wraps around to grip the edge of a jacket, something like that. And the rib is not made by an extra set of threads. It's made by the knitting pattern, which is a knit pearl. So there's a plain and a pearl. It depends on where you stick the needle. And I'm going to demonstrate a knitting pattern in a moment. Then we have a, a nylon knit. This is a single knit, very almost transparent. You can see through it. Jersey, this is what slips are made out of. Many people don't even know what a slip is these days, but it's an undergarment worn between the skin and the garment. This is synthetic. It is nylon. Remember nylon was uh, one of those things that was early on invented, I believe 1924 in place of, or synthetic silk, in place of our parachutes used for stockings. This is a slip weight. This is purple. And one disadvantage to nylon is it will melt. So when flame comes to it in our burn test, you'll see that it will melt. And then finally, we have a knit, which is, is in our last box, the number six box in the vertical. This is a single knit. You can tell it's a knit, single knit. There's just one layer of knitting here. But there is an extra set of yarns. Whoops, throwing it everywhere, Pam. The extra set of yarns creating a, a pile. And again, we know pile is loft. And you can see the depth that it creates on top of that rigid, not rigid, but the solid knit backing. And this is pile or called plush. This is synthetic. It is a stretch velvet or called vel pané. And you might have a black, a brown piece or an aqua piece. And this is number 33. It goes in the very last square on your first, your first column on non-woven. I'm just gonna pause a moment and show you some knitting as I have some right here. This is a hand batten, by the way. So this would this would push down the fibers. This is when I studied with Navajo. This would push down the fibers on a loom. And then let me get out my knitting needles. Okay. So we talked about knitting uh, being a two-needle method. 
and knotting being a uh, crochet being one needle. So this is a set of knitting and this is why you can have a knit purl technique because you can have a bigger up down quality here. You can cast on. I will be doing regular knit by putting my needle underneath. I'm going to work to the edge of my needle. We all had to learn to knit at my house. So there's six kids. It was a way to keep us quiet. So uh, maybe I do it this way. So I'm wrapping my needle around, my thread around my needle. I push it through and pull it up. And I transfer it on to my other needle. I put my needle underneath wrap my needle, my thread around, push my needle through and transfer it to my other needle. So now I have it on two, I'm using wooden needles. I have my piece on two needles. And you will see that I'm using a wool yarn. It's quite, has a quite a bit of dimension. So it's a, a large diameter. I wrap, push through, put my, put my needle underneath the previous, wrap it around and push it through. So purl would be the opposite. I wouldn't put my needle underneath. My mom never was without her knitting bag. We had to learn to do potholders and mittens. Because <laughs> with six kids, here, learn this, everyone learned it. But uh, I'm just going to do this one row so that you can see I transfer from one piece to the next piece. Okay, so that's one full knitted piece on here. So if I turn this around and I'm starting on my same side, okay, I'm gonna do the same thing. If I turned it the other way around, I'd be doing the opposite. So I think you can do purl by doing it on the other side. So I'd have to review that. So this is my basic. But I just wanted you to see that one thread looped, really looped, and then together to create this. Now on this side, the right side, I have started by tapering, and then I've added a second set of threads. You can see they're tied on the back so that I can create a design of two color. Okay, questions on knitting because we're gonna move from knitting on to a new technique. Again, these are not woven. These threads, not two threads interacting at 90 degrees. This is one thread with two needles. The next group that we're gonna do, please label the top of your page as knotted. So this is a knotted construction, K-N-O-T. Uh, I didn't glue mine yet, so now I have to do this and show you. So there will be knit and there will be knotted, okay? So knot is your second column. And this is really fun to think about. The first piece that we're gonna look at that is knotted construction is lace. So this is where we have some very transparent work. Okay, so you can see that this is characterized by a series of lighter areas that have a six sided piece and then an extra set of threads creating a design which kind of reminds us of eyelet. So this is lace, it's synthetic, it's man-made and it is nylon, you might have a pale blue piece. The next piece is knotted and this is called net. This is what's in between on our lace piece. Okay, our lace is here, but when it's just the six sided, it is net. So you can count these sides. One, two, three, four, five, six, and see that it is interacting as a knotted piece. Again, one yarn interacting in a knot, in a knot capacity 
to create a complete thing. This is acrylic. It is fuchsia. So acrylic is a synthetic. Again, remember this was early on. And then the next one is virtually transparent. This is knotted. Let me see if, oh, this is yellow. Okay, hold on, I thought I had a white piece. Let me just put it on to a piece of white. Well, you're gonna to have to get gloves out of the other room. Yeah. So this is a piece of yellow. You can barely see it, but you can see this is a very fine net. It's four-sided diamond shaped. So you see it is the shape of a diamond. This is nylon fiber. It's called tulle, T-U-L-L-E, as in veiling for wedding veils. And if it's white, it is virtually transparent. That's why we've gone to giving you a yellow piece. So we have uh, in our knotted capacity, we have a knotted lace, which is a blend of net and additional layers. We have net, which is six sided. And then we have fine net, which is four sided diamond. The top of the third column should say pressed fibers, just pressed fibers. This is non-woven. So there's no weaving, no knotting. It's just a bunch of fibers that are cut and then they are stuck together. So the first one we have, and we've used this before, right? Do you remember what we used? We used it in our buttonhole. It was a uh, Pellon. So there's many short fibers stuck together, heated and with water shrunk together. There's no grain. and it is synthetic. So the first piece, do you guys have the black pieces first? Yes, I do. Yeah, I have a black piece. Okay, so there's two layers. One is the fiber layer. And you'll remember this from our white that we used in our buttonhole. And the second layer is the glue layer. So in this case, it looks like this kind of knitted piece, but this is the glue piece that goes onto it. It's interfacing, it's called Pellon, and it can be white or it can be black. Those are really the only two colors it comes in. Now I'm questioning this, this I'm questioning this piece because to me, it's not a series of short fibers mashed together. So I'm gonna have to look at this and see why you have that in your kit because this does not work for me. But you can put it under, it's still a non-woven, it's still some a pressed thing and it's is uh it is a interfacing okay our next pressed fiber is a synthetic blend and this is an imitation of wool felt and this way you can really see those the fiber there is nothing that we can pull apart here we can't you know it's really it's a series of short fibers there's nothing. We can pull apart nothing. So a series of short fibers smashed together with heat and water and shrunk and then rolled out and pressed into this, what we call imitation wool felt. This um, wool felt is the one that we used for uh, our hat demonstration. So you might have gold or black or this gray, and you can see that there's a quite a bit of loft. So if it's synthetic, it's not going to burn the same way that our wool would, and that's how we can tell. But it's characterized by the fibers on both these sort of loose brushed fibers, top and bottom, and there's no way to unravel this. It is a pressed piece. Okay, that's your second, third, that's your second piece in the third column. And then we have a category which is other. And our first piece is a piece of hide. This is actually a piece of deer skin. And you can tell deer skin from elk skin. Deer is a lighter weight skin. It has a finished side and it has a split side or a suede side, okay? And you can see um, some grain 
but there is no obvious, there is no vertical or crosswise grain. There's no warp and weft. This, when you're working with hide, you have to work with the way that the hide is when you lay it out on the table. Certain sides pieces will have more flexibility than others, but this is actually a piece of deerskin leather. It's protein based, it's animal, does not ravel, and it is sold by the square foot. All of the other pieces that we've been looking at have been sold by the linear foot or yard by the width of the loom. This is sold by the square foot. That goes into your fourth column of other, and that would be labeled hide number 39. Number 40, this is a leatherette. It is imitation leather. This is vinyl. We saw vinyl on our mock oil skin. Bonded, which means it is heat set glued to a knit backing, okay? And the interesting thing about this is this will melt. It's heat set, but if you iron this, this will melt because it is a plastic base, okay? So that is fake leather, imitation leather or leatherette. That's number 40. Number 41 is fake fur. And this one is a mod acrylic. We talked about when we had when we had acrylic and mod acrylic. Mod acrylic is the longer hair. You can see that this is quite a long hair. So it's a long fiber. Again, it's it is extruded from a liquid through something like a shower head and it could be cut up into any length. This one is, happens to be cut up into about an inch and a half long. So this is uh, bonded to a knit backing. And you see there's a significant loft here. This is the cut side of it so you can see it. This is the uncut side. <laughs> It's used for fabric, and you can also see that it, it can be used for wigs. There's definitely mod acrylic wigs. And I don't think it's bonded. I think, I think it's an extra set of threads that is set into a knit layer. So we could possibly even put that into a knit category, except the fact that it's mod acrylic is kind of is interesting, but you can see that the back is actually a knit. And then this extra set of threads is maybe wrapped around the knit instead of bonded into the knit. Again, it probably depends on the kind of mod acrylic you get. And then we have fake fur, also acrylic are whatever, black and white something, leopard, cheetah. Also on a knit backing, this is a shorter extra set of fibers. The pile creates a thickness of the fabric. The design is surface printed. Notice that the bottom of it is all black. So this part is all black. The design is a surface print. And then we have a wrong side, and it's just called fake fur. And now so the one before was also fake fur. Why is this one so much softer? Well, this one is mod acrylic. Okay, it's it is slightly different. It's both are acrylic, but mod acrylic mod acrylic has that longer fiber. It can be uh, the fiber can be more streamlined and less hairy. If it's less hairy, it's going to be softer like this one. And less hairy mod acrylic creates a wig. You know, a, a, a non-human wig is generally mod acrylic. It's just that the hair where this is very, um, uh, has a lot of fiber sticking out of it. You can have a very smooth shaft. This is a very smooth shaft and a smaller diameter. So there's a lot more hair here per square inch than here. Hmm, interesting. Yep. And then we have a three-dimensional fabric. 
number 43, our last piece, which is neoprene or wetsuit material. And this happens to have a knit face. This is double-sided. So this both sides are knit. This is black on one side, gray on the other. Bonded to neoprene, which is inside. And that is a synthetic rubber. It's not necessary to have a fabric coating on either side of this neoprene, but it tends to make a better wetsuit. So um, original wetsuits were actually just rubber. So this is the synthetic rubber bonded. This is really bonded heat set to a knit on either side. And that's your last piece for non-woven. Okay. Any questions about our samples? Because now I'm going to show you the burn test. Questions about the samples? I'm just thinking about the fake fur because, you know, I used to deal with it a lot and just kind of, I mean, the quality I remember just really varies greatly. And I guess that depends on the process, how it's made, right? Yes, it can be the process of how it's made. Also, the um, fake fur is cut best from the back. So this particular fur, which I showed a cut edge where the, where the scissors have cut through, this is not the correct way to cut fake fur. The correct way, because I did years of the Energizer Bunny, is you cut through just the backing so that the hair remains long and that way you can seam these two together on this piece and not have a seam show at all. Mm -hmm. so you cut the Makes back. Sense. Yeah. This. And uh, we used to, I used to just trace out the pattern and cut the back with a razor blade. Fun. Yeah, single edge razor blade. Okay. <laughs> Let's go to um, screen share. I want to show you the burn test protocol because you're going to be doing this at home. And it gives you the directions. Uh, oh, I guess I have to go here. Okay. So, sorry, don't go blind while I do this because I have it set up up here. Again, this is a the burn test I did last time, you can look at that. So your point of reference from this is, here's your process that you're going to follow. Personal safety, hair should be controlled away from the face. So if you have long hair, you definitely wanna pull it back and or you can put it underneath a scarf or something. Your hands need to be clean and oil-free. As you touch things, the oil from your hands can change the way the fiber is going to respond. So you wanna make sure your hands are clean and oil-free. I would say wash them with soap and water. Don't use hand sanitizer. Hand sanitizer is an alcohol base and alcohol can be a, a flame problem. Work in a dust-free, non-flammable surface. We're gonna go outside and work on the stainless steel table. Here's the equipment that you're gonna need, at least three different fabric swatches. You'll see what I have. You're not gonna know the fiber, please don't get one. I'll show you one that says, this is wool, <laughs> so please don't use that. Tweezers or twongs to, tongs to hold the fabric. Safety matches are lighter, large bowl for water, some water, and the burn test fact sheet. I'm gonna show you that as well. Use a small piece of a swatch, one half by two inches, or you can go up to six inches, you know, so that you can burn a piece, but that's the smallest piece. Grab the swatch with your tweezers, light the match, you're gonna have the flame approach the match, the fabric, and watch what it does. You're going to observe the swatch with the flame. Note how the fabric responds. Does it curl? Does it burn? Does it smolder? We're gonna be talking about all these things in the next segment. Extinguish the flame. If it's not, some fibers are self-extinguishing and we're gonna talk about those. If it does not extinguish, can you blow it out? Do you need to dunk it in the water to extinguish the flame? 
Note the color and the quantity of smoke, if any. Waft the smoke towards you. Don't sniff the smoke. Waft it towards you so that you don't inhale anything. Note the odor and take some notes on it. You're going to then mount those on your satin page where we said burn test. And you're going to identify the fiber. Compare the notes that you took to the burn test fact sheet in each column. And we're gonna do this right now. Compare, do a second burn test if you really don't know what's happening. And if you don't understand it, put it aside and try another sample. And the reason why I say that is when you've never done a burn test, you have to gain some experience by burning some things up and seeing what it's like. One of the things we'll burn is a piece of paper because uh, one of the identifying odors is the odor of burning paper. Another identifying odor for proteins is the burning of hair. And many of you know exactly what I'm talking about when you say hair burning and you can have that odor. It's a sense memory. And then you'll identify the fiber based on your facts and observation. Don't worry about getting it wrong. This is about doing an experiment. So this is an experiment based on your notes and your observation and your technique. And let's look at, this is identifying fibers. This is right out of your textbook. When you don't know what your fabric is, you're going to match it against this. So here's our fiber list down the left, cotton, linen, wool, silk, rayon, acetate, nylon, polyester, and acrylic. And we've touched all of those today. Here's what happens when it approaches the flame. So as you hold the fabric and it approaches the flame, what happens? Does it want to jump towards the flame and catch on fire? Does it draw away from the flame? Does it melt? So you want to think about all of those things. When the flame is engaged with the fabric, is it burning rapidly? Does it melt and burn? Does it drip? What's happening? And then when you remove the flame, is the fabric continuing to burn? Does it smolder? Do, can you blow it out? Is it self-extinguishing? The protein fibers will self-extinguish. Does it burn with difficulty? Does it sputter? And then burns. So you wanna take a note of those things. So we have, how does it approach the flame when the flame is held at the fabric, when the flame is withdrawn from the fabric? Then the odor, is it a burning paper and leaves? Does it smell like burned feathers or hair? Does it smell like celery? That is, it's so bizarre, but nylon smells like celery. Acrylic smells like broiled fish. And then we will discuss the residue that's left on the fiber. Soft gray, not much residue. Very fine residue. Is it crushable, brittle, and black? Because remember, wool is a protein fiber. It's going to be different. Little or no ash, hard, dark bead. So we'll look at all of these characteristics. Okay, so that is in your book, and it is here on your fabric identification page. All right, I have it set up outside. Let's go. Okay, I'm outside now, so I'm gonna be wearing my mask as is required, as people may be coming by. And we're gonna be starting on our masks. Yay, that's gonna be fun. I have metal containers, two of them, and I will be putting water into these so that I have a good safe surface. This one already has water and I'll do a second one. And I'll have my water container just set off camera here. Again, noting our equipment, I have my tongs so that I can hold my wool, <clears throat> my samples. You can light with a, a oh, I, I'm very bad with lighters, but that was pretty good. You can also do a flame stick. You can light a candle 
So this is a little tea light if you wanted to light a candle and that would be controllable as long as out here we often have wind so I can't usually work with that technique. But let me see about lighting a candle and see if I can show you that. When you're lighting, light away from you. So I have my candle lit. And you can see it. Can you guys see it? Is it in the shot? Okay. I don't know if it's going to work. So um, this is why I said do an unknown fabric, because as you can see, this one says wool. <laughs> I'm going to show you what that burns like, just so that you know. And it might be handy for you to have one if you have a label on something. So I'm just going to cut off a one inch by five inch strip. I have another piece which is completely unknown. No idea out of the scrap bin and I'm going to I'm going to use a little smaller piece for that. Again, I have an unknown piece. I'm going to guess what I think it is. We'll talk about that. So, here's this piece. I have a piece that maybe looks like wool. I'm going to, you know, and then I have some upholstery swatches. So I'm going to use that. Now, I came out here and I was actually kind of lucky in that there's a feather and I'm going to burn that first. So I want to know what does wool smell like? Again, I'm going to hold things with my tongs so that nothing is going to come close to me. I'm going to light it. Okay, I'm noticing. So it curled away from it. Definitely there's that burning hair or feather smell. There's a lot of air in between the actual feather itself. So, you know, these fibers have a lot of air in them. Air is a fiber accelerant, is a flame accelerant. So when you have more air, it's gonna burn more quickly. But you could see that it sputtered and it withdrew away from my flame. So again, we're gonna look at how does it approach the flame? What happens when it's burning it? What happens when I remove it from the flame withdrawing? What does it smell like and what is the residue? So the residue here, look at it's a bead. And, uh, and so I understand I really have that smell in my brain. I'm gonna use this sample. And you can see I put my match into my water. I have two waters so that I can always do that. My flame pieces or matches are gonna be far away. So that I, if I accidentally drop something, I'm not going to drop it onto the flame. My candle <laughs> didn't work so well because it's a tea light and underneath that was completely um, empty. So that was a, that was a, looked like a tea light, but it was a fake tea light. So I'm going to burn this one. I'm going to guess it's wool. This is one that said it's wool. And look at those hairy fibers that we had from our wool samples. It feels warm to the touch. So I have a pretty good idea. And now I know what to look for in terms of approaching the flame. It shouldn't really burst into flame. And then when I withdraw, it should self extinguish. So let's take a look. Okay, approaching, see how it curls away from it. Finally, if I'm holding it there, it will burn. It's sputtering and it has self extinguished. The smoke is white. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of burning hair smell, so that's interesting. And after it cools, you can touch the bead. You can see that this is a hard bead. There it feels like a synthetic part in here, even though this is, it says wool design on it, but I'm going to guess that there's synthetic because look at this hard bead. 
that is a melted thing. That does not feel like complete wool to me. So I'm going to guess it's a wool blend, a wool with a synthetic. It does, this hard bead is not at all what my feather was like. Oh my goodness, my tongs have fallen apart. So go to my second pair. Let's pull, burn the other piece. This is, I'm guessing it's wool. It's because of what we think of as wool. It's a tweed, which means it's a, you know, it's a, um, there, the weft is white and there's two colors, so it's fleck. Just gonna see what it does. It, the other one did self-extinguish, which is a wool characteristic. Okay, I'm holding the flame right there. It's not catching on fire. It is smoldering. Definitely smells like hair. And it has a, a black residue that's not a hard bead. So that is a good example of a wool. I was gonna guess this is the blend, but clearly this one was so different in that it actually caught on fire, although it did self-extinguish, but I think that's a blend. This one I think is pure wool. I'm gonna try and uh, see if I can get it to flame on again. It really, it's, you can see it's completely resisting. Now it's finally burning. It is sputtering. It's gonna self-extinguish white smoke. Definitely the burning hair smell. I'm looking at a black residue. Not gonna to touch it right now because it is gonna be hot. So I'm just waiting and I am outside. Okay, it's a crushable residue. So we can look on, I'm gonna make that note and then I'm gonna look at my sheet. Okay. Let's burn this one, mystery. It's a it's a like a light blue or white and gray piece. I'm just checking for stretch because then you might know if there's a spandex or something in there. Hold it with my tongs so it's away from my my hand. I'm gonna burn that. Holding my flame right up to the edge. Took a while to catch on fire. Burning with no problem, black smoke, a vigorous flame. And look at how it burns quickly. Yeah, burning paper odor. The, and now the smoke residue is white, but it continues to smolder and white smoke, to me, I'm gonna guess that's a cotton, really 100% cotton. See, look at how hard it is for that to go out. And now this is why you have your water so it can go in there and be safe. So I'm gonna guess definitely with those characteristics, making your notes, I could burn my other piece again. I could make my notes, make a guess, look and compare it to the um, fabric identification sheet that we have from our our canvas site and see what is it. Okay, this one is very, very thin. I'm gonna guess it's silk, it has a warm hand. It feels warm to touch. Whereas a synthetic feels, uh, I don't know, kind of cool or clammy. It's very thin, so I'm using multiple layers up here. If it is silk, I'm gonna expect that it will be um, less likely to catch on fire that it's gonna smell like burning hair because it's a protein fiber versus my cellulosic, which is more like paper because paper is a tree product. So it caught on fire, self-extinguished almost immediately, white smoke. Definitely the burning hair smell, definitely. So I would say 100% correct, this is silk. I'm gonna look at my bead and that could tell me it's a crushable, but it's a black bead first and then it's crushable. So you see how that really self-extinguished. I feel like I'm gonna get one more that's a synthetic so that we can look at a, how a synthetic burns differently from 
it's somehow I picked all natural fibers. So this is our velveteen. I'm gonna expect that that is cotton, but let's just see if it burns like our previous cotton one. So it should, I'm expecting it to ignite quickly, burn readily and have a smell of burning paper. So it is burning and the sur interestingly, the surface is burning different than the back, but look at the flame, really big flame. I'm gonna put that out. Still burning. Really does not want to extinguish. Yeah, burning paper. I'm wondering about this, this uh, beating up of the water on here, but I think that's just the pile. Okay, so what do you guys think? You have to do- It looks like a lot of fun. It's really fun. You're gonna do three of these and you'll be able to um, set this up, replicate it with either some kind of a tongs. Tweezers are maybe a little close. So you wanna make sure that you're controlling the no amount of fabric if you do that. I was gonna get a synthetic because let me just go run in and grab one. Cause these all ended up being natural fiber. I wasn't sure. Okay, so this is going to be our, our synthetic. This is, as I said, a color only a mother would love. And then Kara, who's also my makeup class said, note that these scratches, this is a tattoo, fake tattoo that I put on for my class. And you have to, you actually have to wear them off. So this has been washed numerous times, but if you wanna do something like a tattoo and you don't, Definitely better than getting one because you could that'll just wash off. And they look pretty good. My, when I went home that first day, my son said, oh, did the, wow, did you get a bad cat scratch or something? All right, so this is a large piece. I'm gonna expect that this is gonna melt because it's gonna be some kind of synthetic. I'm gonna carefully look for the odor to see whether it's a polyester, an acrylic or a nylon. And remember nylon is the celery and acrylic is the broiled fish. So we're really gonna take a look at that. I'm gonna lower the camera so that I'm closer to my water and I'm gonna put my flame on. What's it do when it approaches the flame? So I'm putting it out a corner. You can see it's curling up really onto itself and now it's starting to drip. That's an interesting characteristic. It almost looks boiling. Okay, and then let me waft it. I'm not getting much of a read off of the odor, but let's take a look at the residue. black. It really melted everything. This looks completely melted like plastic. I'm thinking it's polyester because I did not get either the celery or the broiled fish smell. So, but it does melt like it's a plastic. Look at the, how it's really changed the shape of that. We're going to do one more piece just to see. Notice that when I'm putting the flame on it, I'm not putting it at the center. I'm putting it at one of the corners so that it's more readily to catch flame here, to catch on fire. I'm trying to look for the smoke. Looks like white, what definitely white smoke. The flame is sputtering, although it's vigorous, and then it does want to drip. Okay, very good. So now we're gonna go back inside and take a look at our um, sheet just for one second to see how that works and if we can determine which any of these were.
Okay, I'm going to screen share to our uh, fiber fact sheet so we can figure out if uh, we made a good guess out there. So these are our characteristics for fiber, how the flame approaches, when the flame is held there, what happens, when the flame is withdrawn, what happens, what is the odor of it, and what is the residue. So the first thing that we burned was something that was wool. It was marked wool. It did draw away from the flame, but it melted. It was self-extinguishing. And it was a, a brittle bead, but not really crushable. So that led me to think that maybe it was a blend. The second piece that we burned actually was, again, wool, drew away from the flame, uh, melted and burned, self-extinguished, and it had the great burned feathers. And this was a crushable. You can see that this actually crushes and leaves a residue on my fingers. So it crushed and was a residue on my finger versus this first one, which is a really a hard black bead. So that was very interesting. The next one we did was 100% cotton. It burned quickly, it burned so quickly we had to put it right into the water rapidly and it smelled like burning paper leaves, not much residue on the end of that. And then I burned that um, pile piece. Sorry, I forgot to bring that in. And this piece, which I guess to be uh, silk, again, we burned the end of it. It drew away from the flame. It did melt. It didn't burn for quite a while. And then it melted, self-extinguishing, and there was a crushed, crushable black residue. Still smells like burning feathers or hair. And then we did our super mystery piece, like what is this thing? And it's a uh, pink, it has a very hard bead. And I was guessing polyester melts before contact, melts burning smoke, kind of a chemically smell, hard bead, cream or dark, burns for a while, self-extinguishing. Mm, didn't really do that. Acrylic melts burning before reaching flames, melts. Hmm. Okay, let's see. What do you guys think? We'll have to take a look. This is one of those that's a mystery. I'd probably have to burn it again. I didn't. There was, what was under acrylic? Acrylic. Did you guys see a, did you see a flame? Can't remember. See, this is why you might want to burn it twice. Like, oh, burns with yellow flame. Oh, that might make it acetate. And it sort of smells like burning paper and vinegar. Hard. Yeah, I don't actually remember. Yeah, hard bead, definitely melting. So see your notes, you realize, oh, I better take better notes. <laughs> so anyway, that's your burn test. That goes on the bottom of your satin page. Where is it? Here we go. Right? So I'm going to label them here. And then just guess what they are. You can make your notes and your observation and say, I'm guessing it's acrylic based on the odor, based on the uh, based on the way it burned, based on the smoke, the residue, how it approached the flame. It'll, it's a really great experiment. We actually do this more times than you'd think. We probably do a burn test uh, maybe once a week or more, depends on what we get. So very interesting. Any questions? Okay, we're gonna stop the recording. So you have all the information that you need for your fabric identification by uh, following that first sheet that says, write your introduction, do you put your fabric samples down, do your weaves, and then do your burn test. And you should have everything you need. You'll have your um, fabric stores list in there. I think you also have your thread count list. You could you know, do a thread count of your muslin or of your um, cheesecloth, and it explains how to do that. So. Um, we're going to wrap it up and have fun with your fabric identification. It's one of my favorite things.